You know, I apologize. I, I was uh, kind of uh, creeping up on stage here, and I don't like to run up on other speakers, but I have a hard stop because I don't know if you noticed, but a, a, a couple headlines in the news lately that are concerning people about the economy, uh, which is interesting because, of course, we've been uh, full of concerning headlines about the economy, yet, of course, you probably have one of the best years you've ever had over the last year, which begs the question, what, what, what the heck's going on out there, to say the least? Now, we are definitely moving, uh, of course, from one type of conversation to another type of conversation, from the sublime to the ridiculous, if you will, as the case may be. But you know, it isn't all that different when you think about the book. Well, we just rebooted. There we go. Apparently, I'm walking too hard. I'll let me walk very softly up there. Um, and and uh, uh, to uh, to just kind of introduce this, let me let me take you back to uh, the, the very end of last year. Q4 GDP, by the way, last year was 6.9 percent. That's a pretty good number, right? We can also say that December's unemployment rate was 3.9 percent. February just came out with 3.8 percent, so sub 4 percent unemployment rate. You look at these numbers, and you're like, wow. Uh, but then you pick up the paper, and you might see a headline like this. Uh, this is from December, the New York Times. Good morning. Why do Americans say the economy is in rough shape? Because it is. <laughs> now, I'm picking on the New York Times here, but please, uh, if you picked up, a, uh, you turn on Fox News, they tell you the same thing, right? It's irrelevant of the source of the media. And that's the key. That's the first thing we have to get across here. You know, when your folks are coming in the room, yeah, you're making a connection when they're sitting down across from you. What they need to know is what the hell's happening in housing. Right? And what they are hearing is stuff on TV, stuff in the newspapers, stuff from, if you will, our policy leaders, stuff that, by the way, for the most part is full of nonsense. Okay? Unfortunately, you know, economists have largely ignored the narrative to their peril. Now, a couple of, about a year or a year and a half ago, Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winning economist, wrote a book called Narrative Economics where he basically pointed a finger at the entire economics community as only a Nobel Prize winner can, and say, we are missing the boat here, people, okay? Because he said that, you know, economists start with this idea of rationality. Ergo, we think the narrative is moved by the data. It's not. The narrative has a life of its own. And when the narrative and the reality become far apart, well, then we all got to be careful. We have to be careful from a global standpoint, and of course, when people are coming in the door, they're gonna to look to you for the real information. So what I'm gonna to try to do today, and, and a little bit of time, and hopefully have a few minutes for Q&A at the end of this, is to try to give you a broader sense of what's going on out there. Because I can tell you right now, it's nothing like what you're hearing in the paper. It's nothing like it. Let's just start with the short term. Short term is very simple. Look, uh, what was I here with you last? Was it two years ago? Right? Was it two or three or two, right? Two years ago, right? Right in the run-up to the chaos, right? And, and I, I don't know how much we talked about the chaos. I'm not exactly sure what month it was in at that point in time. But obviously, in the beginning of 2020, I was on a victory tour because we didn't have a recession, remember? We were all told we were going to have a recession. Mind you, no one was talking about epidemics. They were talking about interest rates and the trade war with China and the collapse in real estate and all this kind of yada, yada, yada stuff. In the beginning of 2020, everybody went, oh, sorry. Well, well, I mean, there was no reason to make any of those calls. But of course, irony of ironies, even after I'm on my victory tour, within two months, we're thrust into, of course, the pandemic downturn. Now, all that negative bearishness chaos and the headlines immediately got turned back on. And wow, did the whole world absolutely panic. Here's the reality of things. Look, um, the pandemic was no doubt a tragic natural disaster. Anything that kills millions of people and leaves millions of families suffering is a tragic natural disaster. However, natural disasters do not have long-run economic impacts. In other words, as tragic as this was from a human, human standpoint, from an economic standpoint, it's kind of not a big deal. Now again, that's not what we heard. What we heard was this was the end of the world. The Great Depression. And one of the results of that is we've seen one of the most amazing outpourings of fiscal and monetary policy we have ever seen. Candidly, bizarrely large. That would be the exact word I would use, bizarre. Because, you know, policy is not free. 
They are in the process of overheating this economy like nobody's business, even as public sector fundamentals go to crap. Now, in a very real sense, I would tell you I am very worried about where this economy is heading, largely because I can't quite figure it out. By the way, the last time I couldn't quite figure it out was 2005. I'll let you figure that one out. But mind you, this isn't 2005, because the risks have shifted. In 2005, the risk came from the private sector. It was subprime lending that was ruining the fundamentals of households and, of course, the housing market directly. That is not the situation. The problems we have are being driven by the public sector, but I tell you what, the public sector is starting to cause froth to appear in private sector markets. In other words, there are a lot of weird things out there. But ultimately, ultimately, I can tell you that you have to pay attention to what's going on in policymaking and the potential ramifications. But housing in no way, shape, or form is lining up for the kind of cycle we saw a few years ago. Okay? Nothing like that, but it doesn't mean economic risks are gone. As for geopolitical uncertainties, you situate the situation in Ukraine and, and, and Russia, oil prices, honestly, largely irrelevant for American housing markets. They are certainly tragic. The biggest risk of this is that it's distracting us from the real problems, which is an overheating economy. Now, from a long-term standpoint, look, every time I saw an article over the last two years that started with the words, new normal, I immediately put it down. Because any reporter who thinks that epidemics causes new normals seemingly has forgotten that epidemics have been with humanity, humanity since, I don't know, Egyptian time, for God's sake? There's no evidence that human beings fundamentally change their behavior post-epidemic. It's ridiculous to say such a thing. However, there's no doubt it accelerated underlying trends in the economy. And yet again, these are important issues. First, the two major issues is work from home and, of course, uh, what I would call labor market tightness. And what this means, of course, is the dynamics of where people are going to live is going to flip pretty dramatically over the next few years. And yet again, from a sheer market standpoint, yet again, something you need to be paying attention to. There's a lot to go through. Buckle up, here we go. <laughs> Forecast Hall of Shame. Here's some of the ridiculous headlines we were subject to at the beginning of this say, going to start the labor market for the next decade. Worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Uh, 30 to 40 million people are going to be evicted from, from their apartments. And of course, according to Mark Zandi, 30% of American home loans are not going to pay their loans anymore. Watch out, anybody. Home prices are going to start plummeting in any second now. now. It didn't quite work out that way. They get right down to it. Why? The U versus V debate. Remember this at the very beginning? You know, economists can't have real conversations. We have to devolve it into a letter. There was a V camp, including UC Riverside. We said this was going to be a big bounce back for the reason I already told you. But most everybody else was saying U, but the real pessimists were saying a square root side. One clown was screaming at L. Honest to God, we're going to hit bottom and never grow again. <laughs> really? And someone actually put you in the newspaper? I mean, the stupidity that papers deliberately pick up to try and panic the readers is unbelievable. Well, look, the data's in, folks. The V head is here. There's no discussing it. Overall, gross consumption is back to where we were on trend. Yes, this was the deepest recession in U.S. economic history. It was also the shortest, less than one quarter, and recovery took less than a year and a half. To put this in context, less than a two-year business cycle beginning to end, the Great Recession was nine years. So nothing like what we've seen in the past. Now, when you think about why, very simple, a different kind of shock than system. Typical recessions come from demand shocks, which is to say something happens to aggregate demand. In the Great Recession, subprime bubble pop, asset prices fell, and Americans suddenly realized they were nowhere near as rich as they thought they were. Ergo, we have to save more. And that is the problem. When everybody's saving, the entire economy's having trouble growing. Keynes talked about this. Well, guess what? This was not a demand shock. This was a supply shock. The difference? In 2010, people didn't go to restaurants because they couldn't afford to. In 2020, they didn't go to restaurants because they weren't allowed to. <laughs> Why is that different? Because we're good Americans, and if you can't spend your money on a restaurant, you're going to damn well spend it on something else. <laughs> And by the way, anybody try to buy a camper, or a boat, or a hot tub, or a bicycle, or pretty much anything that wasn't nailed down in the store, knows exactly what I was talking about. It was all sold out. We never heard that story, did we? 
We never heard that story. Of course, the pre-recession economy, remember the beginning of 2020, things are fine. In the beginning, by the way, of 2008, things weren't fine. The economy was a mess from top to bottom. In other words, we could weather the storm. And as already noted, government response back then was inadequate. This time was excessive. Now, it doesn't feel like the same kind of economy, but that's because, again, we've seen a big shift in spending as a result, of course, of the basic of the supply shock. For example, on the left-hand side, this real consumer spending relative to the trend. Spending on services took a big hit, you know, and this includes hotels and Disneyland and, and recreation. Well, it's still struggling to get back to norm. However, spending on goods not only is back to normal, it's way above normal. At one point in time, spending on durables was 25% above normal. And by the way, it's interesting because honestly, these numbers would be much more acute but for the supply chain problems. Look at sales right now of autos and the inventory of autos. The only reason durable goods sales are high right now is because they can't build enough cars. It's as simple as that. And you've been hearing all sorts of terrible news about the supply shock and what does it mean for the economy? Honestly, it may be a good thing that it's putting a little break, if you will, on overall consumer demand. Because right now, clearly it's excessive. Clearly it's excessive. Ultimately, look, supply follows demand. Simple as that. Trust me, if there is a buyer, the supply chain will keep up. It's no threat to our economy right now. As for the service sector, it is starting to come, come back. We had a good fourth quarter, all said and done, despite Omicron. Omicron was the big wave, as you all, that last one. Did Omicron mean anything for the economy? Well, the only thing you have to do is take a look at Las Vegas, okay? <laughs> By the way, I went to Vegas in, in the in middle of December for an event I had to do there. It was National Rodeo Week, by the way. <laughs> Two things I gotta tell you about Las Vegas during National Rodeo Week. A, it was really, 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 really busy, okay? There were people wall to wall. B, if you didn't have a hat on, you look kind of weird. That was me, by the way, <laughs> all right? Didn't have the hat on. But to say the least, look at the numbers through the roof. There's two kinds of Americans out there, people. There are those who are vaccinated, thus they don't care. Those who are unvaccinated, Clearly proving they don't care. You see how that works? <laughs> we moved on. Now, why is the economy overheated? Well, again, it all goes down to excessive government policy reaction. Take a look at government spending, just direct subsidies to American households. That's that top line, again, is relative to trend. You've never seen anything quite like this. For every dollar lost by Americans because of the pandemic, for every dollar of income lost, by Americans because of the pandemic, the federal government gave Americans back, you ready for it? $2.60. A 2.6 to one replacement rate. This isn't stimulating the economy, folks. This is called trying to buy an election. Now mind you, they were all giving the money to us, so I'm not exactly sure how they thought that was gonna buy them the election, them being whatever party happened to be spending the money at that particular point in time. But nevertheless, it's off the charts, and you can see it, $2.5 trillion in excess cumulative savings. Excess, on top of the three trillion we're already said, three trillion dollars excess uh, uh, checking deposits right now. Uh, no wonder the, the credit markets are incredibly clean. You're looking for some foreclosures, you're in the REO market, good luck to you, okay? Doesn't exist right now. Of course, it isn't just Congress that got into it, Mr. Powell, right? You know, push interest rates down to zero, and then lock four trillion dollars in quantitative easing at the economy. Quantitative easing, by the way, was a new tool pioneered by Jerome Powell, I'm sorry, by, uh, by uh, uh, Ben Bernanke, in, of course, the incredible crisis that really set off the Great Recession in a true way. Now, to be clear, uh, he and, and Jenny Young did about three, a little over three trillion dollars in quantitative easing over six years. Jerome Powell, by the way, did it over lunch. Okay, and the real question is why? Why would you do this? I mean, keep in mind, Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke were fighting in a complete meltdown of the U.S. financial markets. Massive loan losses, a collapse in household wealth, all massively deflationary. Right now, household net worth is going up. The credit markets are incredibly clean. What are you doing, Mr. Powell? By the way, it's with Mr. Powell, not Dr. Powell. He's not an economist. He's a lawyer. He's a lawyer. Now, mind you, we need lawyers. No, 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 listen. All right, if I get wrongly accused, I want a lawyer. If I get rightly accused, I want a lawyer. But I don't want one putting a filling in the back of my mouth, but I don't want one running the Federal Reserve. 
But there he is, just doing what everybody else is doing, believing the stories of doom and decline. And all that money is causing markets to go crazy. In 2019, there was $100 billion in venture capital. In 2021, $230 billion. By the way, the number of good ideas in our economy did not increase by 2.3 times from 2019 to 2021. The PE ratio prior to the meltdown we're seeing right now, second highest PE ratio ever seen. Cap rates continue to fall despite the fact that we're not really sure where commercial markets are going. Uh, fourth quarter last year, look at commercial real estate transaction volumes. Let that number boggle your mind just a little bit. Now here's somebody like, oh, it's because people are worried about the 1031 exchange going away. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, how about Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin, by the way, that Ponzi scheme, yeah, that was dying as it well as should have until this began. Boom, up it went away, and now it's running, I don't know, $40,000, give, give or take $5,000. For the record, we've done a lot of careful analysis. There is a fundamental value to Bitcoin. It's zero, okay? <laughs> so if it drops another $40,000, we'll be right on cue. Uh, I don't, I'm not even going to debate it. It's just ridiculous. And of course, what this becomes, of course, is it becomes self reinforcing. Right now, over the last two years, Americans have picked up $30 trillion of new household net worth. $30 trillion. That's insane. And of course, they can't spend it. So what are they doing? They're investing it. And investing it, the markets get hotter and more overheated, which makes household net worth go up. You see how this feeds back on itself, and now, what you know, the world's going absolutely crazy. A financial obligations ratio, the share of household income spent in debt because every refinance in these crazy little lakes is now below 13%. We're the richest country ever, and to think it was only built on $11 trillion of federal stimulus. <laughs> now, yes, we have to worry about what's going on in Ukraine, but maybe not as much as we might have thought. I mean, look, at the beginning of this thing, I thought, oh my God, the dictator's taking over again. Here we go, another 1930 cycle where we have a world war, fascism versus democracy. Well, turns out the Ukraine is a little tougher than Mr. Putin thought. <laughs> and the Chinese are going, yeah, no, we're not going anywhere in our Taiwan anytime in the near future, thank you very much. Because you think running supply lines through your Ukrainian forests are hard, try doing over 130 miles of open ocean, okay? So, with that in mind, what is everybody freaking out about? Well, they're freaking out about gas prices. Oh my God, are you kidding me? In this day and age, spending on gasoline has never been lower as a share of income than it is right now. In 1973, we did have a problem. Everybody drove around a $7,000 car that got two miles to the gallon. Okay, not today. today. You know how many electric vehicles are coming out? How many hybrids are in the market today? If you have to drive to work at all, and by the way, you don't want to drive to the store, Mr. Bezos will take it right to your house for you. <laughs> what are we talking? Is there not even that high? If you inflation adjusted, gas prices in California would have to get to $7.30 a gallon to look like they were in 2011. Stop. Just stop. What we need to worry about is too much consumer spending. Because look at the right, left hand, right hand side. This is real consumer growth minus real GDP. It goes back to 1960. Three big surges of spending compared to GDP in the run-up to the early mid-70s recession, to the run-up to the 1990 recession, and to the run-up to the Great Recession. Excessive consumer spending runs and badly. And boy, I feel like we're getting into one right now. Simple as that. Now, where are the jobs? We're still down, you know, 2.5, 3 million jobs from where they were, but that's nothing to do with labor force demand. We know that. Look at job openings, over 10 million. I don't care what the unemployment rate is in whatever local economy. I defy you to drive down any street and not find a how, how blunt sign right now. The problem in our labor markets is very clear. We don't have enough people in the working age. And this was written on the wall. I probably showed this two years ago, and like most long-run data points, you glossed over it completely. <laughs> Because that's what we all do. We're so concerned about the next couple of years, we don't pay attention to the trend. But the long run trend all boils down to the boomers. Look at this population sort of quote unquote pyramid on the, on the right hand side. You can see the huge pyramid up to those folks in their 60s. The boomers, the boomer generation, an incredibly important demographic turning point in US history. Boomers, all raised in families of 12 kids, all went out and had 1.2 kids, which they excessively overparented. <laughs> 
giving me my insanely anxiety-ridden, self-insecure workforce. Thank you very much, boomers. I appreciate it for handing me a bunch of sissies. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little wound up today. A little too much caffeine. Anyway. Left hand side, it's very clear. 2020, there was a decline in the number of people from 15 to 64 years. It was going down, not up. We were in decline. And of course, during the course of the pandemic, what happened? Three million people dropped out of the workforce in 2020. Three million. To be clear, that is insane. This has never happened before. Now, what did they do? They retired. You know, all these newspapers asking these questions. Oh, is it long COVID? Are they afraid to work? Are they stuck at home? You know, what is it? Uh, uh, excuse me, we have a survey. We do it every month. They ask people who are in the workforce, why aren't you in the workforce? <laughs> They're retired. That's what they did, okay? They were getting ready to anyway. This seemed like a great time, and they did. And as a result of that, well, by the way, income inequality is falling. <laughs> falling sharply in the U.S. Wealth inequality is going up, separate conversation, but income inequality is coming down. There's a whole new group of people. The bottom quartile of folks are now seeing one of the greatest acceleration in earnings compared to everybody else. This is giving a whole new set of people access, yes, to home buying like never before. So this is relatively good news from a long run standpoint. But of course, in the short run, what it means is every local economy has to focus on a whole new form of economic development. It used to be jobs, jobs, jobs. You remember that? It's jobs, 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 jobs. No, it's not. It's workers, workers, workers. Because now, without enough workers, every economy is fighting for the body. If the body is there, the job will come. You don't have to worry about it. How do you expand your workforce? Well, extensively, get people to move to your neighborhood, have more babies. You can do it intensively by getting more people to participate, to actually work in your local economy. And of course, ultimately, we're all going to have to bring on the robots. Remember two years ago, we were afraid of the robots? We need robots, okay? But again, it's a completely different kind of conversation. When it comes to attracting workers, suddenly, it's a different kind of game. It's about quality of life. It's about housing availability. It's about school districts. It's about restaurants and things to do. It's a different conversation. So the next time you walk into some economic developer's office, he says, get out of here, you're bringing me housing, I want jobs. You tell him he's an idiot. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, of course, as for our fair state, California right here, people are moving out. We've been doing it for a while. Now, again, our labor force is way too fine, but it's nothing to do with the unemployment rate. We know there's tons of job openings here like there is everywhere in the Southwest. The very simple reason is we haven't built enough housing for a very long time. We had this conversation a couple of years ago, simple as that. Now, it isn't the end of the world that you're seeing later for California. If you look at labor force growth in Arizona, California, and Nevada, a lot of people who are leaving here are moving to Arizona and Nevada, among Idaho and, and Texas and then any place else they hate Californians. Um, but the key here is even though we don't have labor force growth, we have lots of growth in the extensive margin. When you think about who's moving out and who's moving into California, lower skilled folks are moving out, higher skilled folks continue to move in. So in an interesting sort of way, while overall population isn't growing, actually our income base is growing quite dramatically, our output is growing quite dramatically. So in a sense, yet again, California is turning into country called California which means on the extensive margin, not so much growth, but on the intensive margin, particularly in demand for housing, lots of potential growth out there, no doubt about it. Of course, with the economy on fire, profits have come back, business investments come back, a lot of good numbers, particularly for, for California, IP equipment, software, way, way up. But look at the bottom, from 2019 to 2021, a 33% increase in residential investment. Mr. Remember Mr. Zandi's? Uh, prescient idea, 30% of people are going to stop paying their mortgage. Hmm. We had a 30% increase in actual investment in new housing. Not quite the same thing what happened. And you see the numbers, right? We have, right at the very beginning, everything turned down, and then all of a sudden, existing home sales took off, and they kind of been fading up and down. New home sales, huge surge, has calmed down just a little bit, but still hot from where we were a couple of years ago. What happened? Prices up. 20% year over year nationally. Look at the numbers. US overall, uh, last 15 months compared to the previous 15 months. 5.7% over the 15 previous months, 24% over the last 15 months. You've never seen anything like it. And the big accelerations, Phoenix, Tampa, Miami, Dallas, Las Vegas, San Diego, Seattle, San Francisco, Atlanta, Charlotte, 
Denver, New York, so on and so forth. Huge numbers across the board. Uh, here's some county values uh, in different places. Again, everywhere you look, home prices are up. Why? So uh, permits are up, right? Sharply, not any homes going on right now. Completion's also increasing sharply. What happened? Two things happened. The first has a lot to do with what wasn't happening in 2019, which is the real estate market was very cold. Remember how cold it was? In fact, when I came to you then, my conversation was real estate's fine. But the big question is why is it so cold? Well, now we know. It's the narrative. Do you know how many people walked up to me in 2019 and asked me this simple question? So I wonder home prices are gonna fall. <laughs> not, not are they going to fall. When are they going to fall? And that's funny because look at Home prices don't fall unless there is all hell breaking loose in the housing markets. It has to be an enormous shock to the system for nominal prices to come down. And there's nothing wrong with the housing market. I was walking around and you're going, when are they going to fall? Uh, never, maybe? <laughs> Certainly not any time in the next three years. What are you thinking about? But everybody thought that. Now, mind you, the market had cooled a bit. Interest rates had come up. There was a change in tax laws. All these things will cause the market to go cold. But then, of course, all the howling bears of the press got on board, told us how terrible everything was, and everybody started believing home prices are going to fall. So no one was in a rush. No one was in a rush. And of course, because no one was in a rush, it got even colder, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now what happened? Well, we got into the pandemic and a few things happened. First of all, our checking accounts started bursting at the seams because, you know, everybody kept giving us money for no particular reason. <laughs> Second thing that happened is interest rates went down like nobody's business because of Fed policy. And the third thing that happened is I realized I love my kids, but not that much. <laughs> I need a bigger house. <laughs> and they went out, and what did they find? There was nothing to buy. Inventories prior to the pandemic were four months. That's tight. And of course, by the way, not a lot of people are selling their homes in the middle of a pandemic, which meant it was even tighter. So people walked out and they found a line of 100 people to look at that open house. And we went from one extreme to the other to we could just take our time to, oh my God, I will never be able to buy a house. And overnight, the markets went crazy. And what's interesting is new homes are, you know, they're still about six months inventory. It's been steady. They're meeting that demand. But the entry level market, the sales and inventories of existing homes for sale is incredibly tight. And some of this, no doubt, is people wanting to buy their first home. A lot of this is flippers who see the move up value add option who are getting into the market as well. But everybody's buying everything in sight. And it's just hot, hot, hot. And you can see the numbers. This is across LA. Again, everything is incredibly tight. There's nothing to sell. Weeks on the market is, is preposterously low right now. It's just insane how tight the market is. Now, what's happening on the mortgage side of things? Well, obviously, with big decline in interest rates, a huge amount of mortgage originations, largely driven by refis, as the case may be. And what's interesting about that is you can take a look at out change in outstanding mortgage debt. This gives you an idea of people buying new homes or taking cash out. And that has been really, really cool, really calm. It's mainly been the turnover stuff, but the last year or so, it has picked up a bit. Not, not as dramatic as say we saw back in 2005 and six, but it has absolutely started to pick up. But the key question is, is, is this a bubble? And the answer is absolutely not, at least not in the way we saw in 2005. When you say the word bubble, there's two things to think about in that front. One has to do with what I would call the kind of ethereal idea of fundamental values. And then the other is the concrete idea that things are happening in this industry that are clearly not sustainable. Let's put aside that first comment the, of fundamentals for a second and focus on on the, the real things. Everything was going wrong in 2005. We were building way too many homes. We sell way too much price appreciation. And of course, on top of everything else, the credit quality was going to crud and people were buying homes they clearly couldn't afford. Everything was going wrong. Right now, the exact opposite. This is a cash fueled, fueled boom. Take a look at household equity and housing. It, it does not, Equity in housing bottomed out at about $8 trillion in 2012. It's now approaching $25 trillion. Overall, debt, debt equity levels are now at the lowest they've ever been. Credit quality that is out there is some of the highest we've ever seen. And in terms of affordability, and this is one of the things that I, it just makes me crazy. In the run up to the 2020 election, one of the big things was the incredibly high cost of housing. 
What's funny about that is if you look at the data, in, the, in 2011, 28% of homeowners in the United States were housing cost constrained. By 2019, that had declined to 20%. Housing was more affordable, not less. But we just told a completely different story. Even in California, for all the crazy increases, in 2011, 38% of homeowners in California housing cost constrained. By 2019, that had dropped to 28%. Housing is affordable for the people buying it because of low interest, because of buildups of wealth, because of growing incomes. It's not a bubble. But if you look at the big jumps recently, housing PE ratios have been jumping. What's a PE ratio? Same thing as in stock, but here I'm looking at the price of a home compared to the rent being asked for a Class A apartment in these different economies. And yeah, things look like they're getting a little out of whack because prices are going up even though rents aren't. Now, rents are starting to catch up. There's no doubt about it. After being cool, all of a sudden rents are jump, jumping and jumping sharply. Clearly, inflation will be putting rents forward. But nevertheless, you do have to worry about prices getting a little ahead of their fundamentals. But when you think about it from buying power, from equity, from credit quality, housing is absolutely fine. So the fundament, there's no problem in the fundamentals that would say housing is due for a crash. But if housing gets ahead of itself because of a price situation, it will flatten out. There will be a plateau out there at some point in time if the economy starts getting ugly. But a plateau isn't bad, and it's nothing for potential buyers to be afraid of. This one they can weather. 2006, not a chance. Now, what about this workplace situation, right? I said that, you know, it's interesting, the work from home situation. It, it, according to a, a survey from the Atlanta Fed, prior, prior to the, uh, this pandemic recession, about 10% office days were work from home. Doing uh, uh, interviews with uh, CEOs, human resource managers, suggests that post pandemic, about 30% of jobs will be work from home. And this is something that all employers have to pay attention to, because remember, we don't have enough workers. So every employer has to fight for good workers, and that means better pay, better benefits, and yeah, giving them quality of life if they feel like working from home, you're gonna to have to, to let that happen. Now, to be clear, they did a survey, uh, asked people, how often do you wanna work from home? And what's interesting is about a third of people said, I always wanna work from home. And about a third of people said, never, okay? Said never. Um, so you're gonna to have to make good. You're gonna to have to make do with that situation. Now, what does that mean from a housing demand situation? Well, if you only have to go to work once a month or once a week, you're far more willing to live far away from your place of work. So think about that. Think about places like Spokane, Washington. People are hating Seattle for all sorts of reasons. It's expensive, they got an insane city council, and you'll think about Spokane. Hey, you know LA, Orange County, look how expensive Orange County is, right? Well. Now you can come up here, live here. You only go down to Orange County for work twice a, twice a week. So it changes the pattern of housing demand and it's gonna push a lot more demand to farther away places. The quality of life becomes number one. Now what about the public sector? There's no doubt, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You've seen an enormous increase in public debt. $10 trillion in seven years. Five trillion in the last two. And to be clear, we came into the pandemic with a trillion dollar structural deficit at the, at the federal level. Okay? The Trump and the Republicans, when they were in charge, passed budgets that left us with a trillion dollar structural deficit. We got into the pandemic, we're borrowing more. The Biden administration is in now. They've expanded the structural deficit, hard to say by how much, maybe another half a trillion. So we are nowhere near fixing this thing. The gas foot is still on the gas pedal. And you talk about the twin deficits. This is the thing that worries me. Remember when I talked about the overconsumption problem? Look at the trade deficit, the nominal trade deficit. In the run-up to the Great Recession, nominal tra the trade deficit was about 6% of GDP. As of January, I didn't get yesterday's number in, it was a $90 billion one-month deficit. That's about 4.3% of G GDP. We are moving in a bad direction. We are consuming too much. And this is a sign of problems to come. And mind you, we have big problems with debt down the line because of retiring boomers. Now, as already noted, it isn't just, of course, the federal government. The, uh, the, uh, the Federal Reserve has poured tons of money in the economy. And lo and behold, inflation's kicking in. Well, that's what happens. When you give an economy a lot of money it doesn't need, and there's lots of demand, prices are going up 7% year over year. Now, here's the crazy thing about it. 
The markets are set, aren't saying, oh my God, inflation is here, run. They're saying, inflation, what inflation? Inflation expectations have barely budged. Again, the narrative. Because Jerome Powell, the lawyer, keeps walking out and telling the bond markets, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's just short term. As soon as supply chains catch up, everything's going to be back to normal. Uh-uh. <laughs> now, mind you, this is what you might want to call, you see no inflation, hear no inflation, speak no inflation. <laughs> and the reason, of course, I want to do that is because no one in the financial world wants to take this into account. Take any large REIT. They don't know what to do with the money they have. Money is flowing in. If they acknowledge inflation, they have to change the rate of return they're going to give their investors. And they don't want to do that because they can't. If they did that, they can't place their money. So lo and behold, financial markets are heating up. Now what drives inflation? Ultimately, it's money, money, money. And right now, if you look at the ratio of money to nominal GDP, you would argue easily there's 20% more inflation in the next two to three years. That's just the number until the Federal Reserve starts to extract money. Now they're talking about it. Oh, maybe we'll do a couple rate hikes. Irrelevant. Four trillion dollars of quantitative easing has to be removed from the money system until anything happens on the inflation front. Here's the best tweet of 2022. Fed's Buller, the monetary fiscal assistance provided in response to the pandemic may have been excessive. All right, that wasn't very good. It's the first reply that I couldn't have said better myself. <laughs> Now the real question here is how does this thing shake out? We already see the first thing starting to happen. Yield curve is starting to flat. That's not a good sign. Mortgage rates are drifted up. The refi market has largely gone flat as a result of that. But remember, the move up market, the buy market is still hot. People have cash. If there's anything to buy, they will buy it. So you're not going to feel it except for in your refi business. Your refi business isn't going to be there, not going to be there for a long time. But there's still plenty of people who want to buy home, and there means there's still things for you to do. But you're going to be going into an issue of rate or rising interest rates. And what you have to worry about is what that means for affordability. Look, if interest rates go to 5%, it's fine. If they go to 7%, we have a problem on our hands. By the way, have mortgage rates been at 7% before? Yeah, they've been at 17% before. Okay? So that can happen. So yeah, there's going to be some patches. But again, the fundamentals of real estate suggest that this is not going to be a collapse in prices or spike in foreclosures. That's not going to happen. But the market could go flat and quiet for a while until yet again it reprices in new interest rates. When does that happen? That's the trillion dollar question. Is it next month? Is it next year? I don't know. I don't know. And that's the, probably the most scary thing I can tell you. Again, the last time I said in no uncertain terms, I don't know, was 2005. Now it is in 2005, it's a different kind of risks, but the risks are there and they are profound. But in the meantime, the economy's back. And anybody tells you that we're still trying to recover, just punch them in the face for me, unless it's a client, don't do that. Then sit down and have a reasonable conversation with them. That was, I think that was in the five, the five languages a lot. Number six was don't punch them, right? <laughs> the economy's bad, tons of pent-up demand. The geopolitics mainly distraction. Labor market slow recovery, a function of labor supply. Remember, it's not job stuff, jobs, it's now, it's now workers, 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 and that's a quality of life and housing conversation for every single local government. The outlook, new roaring 20s, does this end next year? We don't know. But clearly this year is going to be hot, unemployment is going to continue to fall, but there has to be a sugar crash out there. Now housing won't crash with it, but it's going to go through a tough period. When, how, we don't know. It all depends on policy choices. One good scenario is the Fed says, you know, that Thornburg guy maybe he has a point. And they start reversing quantitative easing and things cool off hard. And we all feel grumpy and annoyed in the short run, but we work this out of the system before it becomes dangerous. That's not going to happen. Jerome Powell, like most everybody, wants to keep his job. And he knows that if he does that, he's going to lose his job. So you don't do it. What do you do? Well, you hold off as much as you can. You do a couple rate hikes and you keep blaming inflation on offshoring or oil, which is nonsensical. And of course, now consumer spending starts heating up. And the asset markets go more unbalanced. 
Well, that's going to make when we do finally pull back a little more painful, a little more recession-like. But that would be an early 90s, three-quarter kind of thing. Or this keeps going, and we see excessive investment, too many homes, too many apartment buildings, too many new VC companies. And then, of course, when it blows up, we're talking a great recession. We don't know. But I tell you what, that last one is out there a, long, a few years, to say the very least. And what we all know is right now, the music is playing, you gotta dance. The music is playing, you have to dance. And that's what you need to tell your folks as well. Yeah, it's still a time, good time to buy a house. Yeah, you probably wanna get in. This is a moment to continue to go out there, but don't overextend, don't overdo it. Don't get too far from your bunker. People who get too far from the bunker are the people who get in big problems when this does eventually break. So you continue to move, you continue to do what you need to do, but don't overextend. Understand right now, we are living in a world that's driven by a limited supply of public policy. Enjoy it while it's here, be prepared when it's not. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Couple of questions? Mark. All right. Okay. You can clap first though if you want. Go ahead. Right. 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 Yes, sir. So in theory, I've got, I have to get down and look at the data, but there's probably a compression. That is because the top end of the market, the new home market, they, they make building supply. They haven't had a tough up, up, they haven't had an issue over the last decade. But the entry level, low level stuff is at a very quiet five, six years. There's not a lot of inventory out there. And so there's a big move up across the board. And remember, secondary markets, places you wouldn't have thought of, now have new life being breathed into them because of the reorganization of where people live. So again, it, it actually makes what I would call the places like the high desert, for those of you who know San Bernardino, an attractive option. Which of course, again, last time somebody said that out loud was 2006, and they were saying it for the wrong reason. <laughs> I'm saying it for the right one. Another question. No. All right, you guys are being quiet. I appreciate your attention to, oh, sorry, go ahead. It's it's essentially right. saying the housing market will slow down at some point but it's not gonna break. Exactly, right now, right now. My prediction right now is the housing market, when, when things start slowing down, is the housing market will do what it typically does in these kind of cycles, which is go flat. A big drop in liquidity, a big drop in sales, not a lot of turnover, but there's not gonna be a collapse in housing, there's not gonna be a huge spike in foreclosure. You're not gonna see what happened in 2007, 8, 9. That is not in the cards. Now. Mind you, remember what I said. I don't know what the next four years are gonna look like. For all I know, the lending markets go crazy, subprime has a resurgence, and next thing you know, every clown is out there buying homes they can't afford. Then it's a different story. But based on what I'm seeing right now, that is how I predict this thing ending. So as a follow up, and, and take final takeaway for a group of mortgage lenders, yeah. Over the next three, four years, where's the opportunity for growth for people in this room? All right, well, there's not going to be a lot of opportunity for growth because remember, with interest rates going up, refi is gone. So now you've got buyers. It's either the move up or the entry level. There's lots of entry level buyers right now. There's going to be a lot of new buyers. And those are the ones, by the way, that you have an opportunity to really help. They need counseling more than anybody else does. They should still be encouraged to get into homes, start building that long run equity position. Counsel them not to be panicked about a decline in prices. However, also counsel them do not depend on 10% appreciation a year in your house to make this work for you. Be house smart. And again, go back to what I just said. Talk to your boss. If you only have to go to work two, three times a week, you don't need to live that close to you. Maybe you want to look a little farther afield. There's incredible opportunities out there. There's beautiful places everywhere, right? I mean, look at a place like Moreno Valley, which is full of undeveloped but ready-to-go lots. 
Now again, Moreno Valley has got some rough edges to it, we know that, but hey, 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 hey. When I was in grad school, in the early 90s, I lived in South Santa Monica, which by the way, had some really rough edges back then. Not kidding, it was gang territory. The gangs have been gentrified. They now have to commute in. <laughs> That'll happen in Moreno Valley too. It's just a matter of time. My point is entry level folks should still, still be jumping in the market. The move up folks are still having opportunities out there. But to my point, I just said, don't be ramping up your business that much either. Get good people, move forward, make good decisions, <clears throat> navigate this. Because remember, when you're a servicer in the mortgage space, you are tend to be the, the tail, the, the, the end of the whip. So you have to be prepared. You have to be the one who's not getting too far. But right now, you're gonna still see business. Forget about it. Right now, there's lots of business out there. Lots of business. The market is looking solid right now. You're gonna have a good year in front of you. Make it worthwhile. All right. Y'all have a great rest of your day. I'm sorry I can't get the line. Thank you very much.